Hampshire Food Alliance and my colleagues, Colleen and Erin are here as well. Um, we host these monthly network cafes on different topics. And so today, as you're all aware, we're gonna be talking about meat processing in New Hampshire. Um, so we are hoping to um, have folks who are both raising livestock connect with people who are technical assistance providers and others who have information about food safety and regulations in the state all related to, to meat processing. Um, and I just wanna say that we have uh, four different presenters, although it'll be quite informal. Um, so Elena Ensign from UNH Cooperative Extension, Rob Johnson from Farm Bureau, and then Ryan and Colleen. And I didn't put your um, affiliation there. So can you remind us where you're? Food protection. Thank you. Yep. And then we also have Steve Crawford, who's the New Hampshire State Veterinarian, and Thomas Colaro and Susan Iceberg from USDA Food Safety and Inspection Service. And they'll be on the call available for Q&A when we get there. So I think, Erin, Colleen, am I missing anything? Should we get rolling? We're good to go. All right. So I'll turn it over to Elena. OK. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, so I'm Elena from UNH Extension. And um, yeah, so we're going to dig into the New Hampshire meat processing bottleneck. And I don't know if you guys read the little description, but um, the bottleneck is something that isn't necessarily a new issue, um, but something that's definitely been compounded due to COVID-19. And so I guess today I just wanted to share a little bit about what I've been reading and hearing and um, sort of from more of the processing facility side of things and just things that I've observed as an extension specialist, but you know, the bottleneck usually occurs in the fall and winter months because um, livestock production is really seasonal. Um, so prior to COVID-19, that was the norm. And then fall or spring months, things were, you know, not so busy. So after, once COVID hit, everything just exploded. Uh, homesteaders were producing more livestock, doing it themselves. And commercial producers were trying to um, meet consumer demand and processing more um, if they could. And so the processing facilities where they would always operate at 100% capacity in the fall and winter that extended into their traditionally slower months, so the spring and um, summer. So it was an interesting thing to see. It was definitely a challenge, again, that was compounded, but nothing that was necessarily new. So um, what I have found interesting just reading and doing some research, and I know I only have a few minutes to speak, but I just want to, if I can, share a slide with some resources. Um, and whenever you get a chance to allow me to share my screen, but um, I, you know, through my reading, I found it's really not as simple as getting more processing facilities um, available in the state. And um, these processors, that issue of the slow months is, is really a challenge for them because they just don't have the labor to stay afloat or um, they can't necessarily keep people on when things are slow. So there was this one study that, that showed those key challenges are that availability of labor, um, limit to cold storage is another one, um, access to funding. So these facilities could expand, but the funding isn't necessarily there to help them do that because it is expensive. And then that seasonality of livestock production. So there's a lot of things that kind of compound this issue. And I'm gonna share my screen now. Hopefully you guys can see this. Um, so these are just a few resources that I've really enjoyed reading through recently. Um, and of course, these this is all research that was done prior to COVID-19, but um, 
And, and again, like just sharing these so you guys can maybe take these down and check them out if you haven't already. But um, this visual in the bottom right corner, I thought was kind of interesting. And it's just the density of New England slaughter facilities. And according to this, New Hampshire is one of the most well covered states in terms of access to processing facilities, which that reality is not what, you know, the availability is obviously um, not there for people to be able to just be like, hey, can I get my animal processed? No, you have to um, call a um, I'd schedule a year in advance. Facilities are booking into 2022. So, um, you know, it, it's an issue of us not necessarily utilizing the full capacity of the facilities that we have. And so I've, I've spoken with a few processing facilities and, you know, they, they love that how busy they are and they feel really bad. They can't take on those smaller producers that you know maybe only have a couple animals to go in a year or every so often um but they do say that you know they're really nervous if they see more facilities open up because things are just so slow in the slow months that they have to lay people off and um they're not you know utilizing their facilities like they could um and and yes while COVID-19 um, they have increased production in the slow months. Um, they're busier this time of year than they were before COVID, but they're still not at full capacity and operating like they could be. Um, so I'll just stop sharing there. But um, definitely, yeah. So it is, it is a big issue and I don't know how long I really have. I think I only have like five minutes. So yeah. Um, I just thought I would bring those kind of things to the table for discussion. And um, those are the things that I've been reading and research and seeing um, more so from the processing side of things. So is it is it an issue of not having enough processing facilities? It doesn't seem to be. It's more um, an issue of the seasonality, the lack of labor and know-how to actually do these things and potentially a lack of support for processing facilities in general. Um, but yeah, th those are my observations. I guess I'll stop there for, for discussion or um, for the next presenters. Thanks, Elena, that's really helpful. Um, Rob, and, we'll, and just a reminder, you can put questions in the chat throughout the conversation and then after all four folks have presented, we'll have an open Q&A. Hey, thanks, Jennifer. I just thought I'd touch on uh, some of uh, what is uh, happening in the legislative area, what's going on. In New Hampshire here, we have a, a bill that's been introduced, it's House Bill 437, that it began as a, a study uh, looking at implementing our existing meat inspection, state meat inspection program that is on the books. And that has been amended to essentially take a look at a, a, a broader aspects of the issue. Um, looking at the, the uh, shortage of facilities and just, again, looking at the whole breadth of the, the, the issue. Uh, and in the specific charges of, of the study will be to take a look at the barriers that farmers are facing, potential approach, approaches uh, to improving availability of slaughter is, and then also the finally uh, 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 potentially implementing the, the state program. So that's in the works. It'll be it went through the House Environment and Ag Committee with a strong recommendation of ought to pass. It'll be in the House floor next week, and then it'll go to the Senate, and then obviously to the governor. And we don't anticipate any any uh, roadblocks to that. So that's on the on the state side. At the at the federal level, there's a few things happening. One one that has happened. We're just waiting for rulemaking. Is back in the latter part of the year when the, not the most recent, but the, the uh, COVID assistance package that was signed in late December, that included, uh, there's $13 billion uh, in that uh, legislation towards uh, direct support for, for farmers. Within that $13 billion, uh, billion sometimes the, the B's and the M's get all mixed up, yeah, but the, 
but then that was a, a $60 million that was provided to USDA for the specific purpose of providing grants to existing slaughter facilities, non-USDA inspected slaughter facilities uh, with, with the idea of with that funding that they could then upgrade to, be, to become USDA. So that's, that's you look at it, that's a limit to the, to the grants of $200,000 per an applicant. And um, if you take that, uh, if, if, if you had the 300 applicants, take the whole 200, that would be the whole, all the money. Um, and with 1900 non-inspected facilities in the country, it's, it, it'll, it'll be interesting to see how that is dispersed. Um, it's a lot of interest in it. I can tell you just from on the, the, the national calls that I'm on with, uh, uh, within Farm Bureau, that it's something where we're, the first question almost every call I'm, I'm on is uh, where's the status of the rulemaking within USGA for this program? So um, that's, that's where that is at. And it, it, it allows for, now it's pretty wide open. It allows for the expansion of facilities, looking at uh, um, complying with food safety requirements, complying with packaging, but it also includes language that is very broad that it allow um, such other purposes as a secretary uh, deems appropriate. So it's wide open. So that we're waiting on that. And then there, are, uh, I wanted to mention a couple of bills that are, are in the, the hopper at the federal level. And one is, the, is deemed the, the New Markets Act. It's been introduced. This is the second or third session it's been introduced. And what it would do is it would remove the ban on interstate sale of, of uh, state inspected meat. Uh, so that could be sold uh, in, to other states. And the, the thinking behind that is that state programs that exist need to be by federal standards equal to a greater th than the, the federal program. Um, so that's, that's one, there are, there are currently 27 states that have uh, um, uh, uh, state programs. Now, let me, and along with that, uh, I, I mentioned um, the, the, the uh, COVID, ass COVID assistance bill that, that, that uh, was adopted. That also included some language that, that will, requires a study be done looking at the, that there's, there's what is uh, called a, a uh, uh, cooperative interstate shipment uh, CIS program within the federal government. And, and that and it, it, it promotes the expansion of business opportunities for state inspected programs and it requires that it, this be looked at at a greater extent and, and I, I get to utilize to a greater extent there. I believe it's uh, currently eight states that have plants in their states that ha are, are CIS, uh, the CIS programs. Uh, Maine and Vermont are two of them, though the, the facilities that are CIS are, are I, I got to tell you, I'm not familiar with them. There's one in Vermont and three in Maine, and I think that's smaller type facilities. Um, well, I know my five minutes is about up. I just want to mention there is one other federal bill that, that was recently introduced in February. Our representative, Custer, signed on, and that's the Strengthening Local uh, Processing Act. It, it does a number of things. It, it ups the federal cost share for state uh, inspection programs from 50 to 65 percent. It ups the, the federal contribution for CIS facilities at the state level from 60 to 80, and it provides uh, 10 million dollars uh, in grants for uh, colleges and universities universities to establish and expand meat training programs, and also provides some money to to uh, uh, non-government agencies uh, towards training uh, 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 workers, basically uh, folks in the meat processing industry. I'll leave it at that, Jennifer, for now. Great, thank you so much, Rob. Uh, Roy Ann. So I'm Roy Ann with the uh, State Health Department Food Protection. Um, uh, I do a lot with answering questions about meat producers. Um, <laughs> and I also help um, Elena and um, Mary Choate and uh, Ann Hamilton from UNH Cooperative. Um, with the poultry and rabbit workshops to be able to sell those uninspected to restaurants. Um, I handle complaints and emergency management type of things within food protection. Um, I'm also the liaison coordinator for foodborne outbreaks between um, food protection, the lab and disease control for outbreak investigations. Um, so I'm 
happy to be here today to, to help answer questions. We didn't really set up any kind of um, presentation for this. Um, we figured there's a lot of questions, so we'll just be here to answer questions. So thank you. Thanks, Ryan. Um, Colleen. So, so uh, my name is Colleen Smith. I'm with the State Health Department. I work very closely with Ryan in the food protection section. And as Ryan said, we um, we didn't have a formal presentation. If our role and responsibility is is pertaining to those mostly that want to sell meat products directly to consumers, and we help folks navigate the the requirements depending on the product. Um, as Ryan alluded to, there are there is a law that allows folks to sell uninspected rabbits and poultry to restaurants under certain conditions. Having taken that class um, through UNH Extension and also some labeling requirements, but um, it probably will we'll yield most of our time to to questions that folks may have um, when it comes to selling meat or meat products at retail. Okay, great, thanks Colleen. And um, we've got the time, so I just wanna ask if Steve or Thomas or Susan have anything that they'd like to add. If there was anything that was missed or you wanna expand on. Hey, this is Tom with uh, USDA. No, I, I think uh, the speakers previous to, to me right now have covered really all the all that needs to be covered so far like i said you know, we're available for any questions that anyone may have okay great um steve crawford did you want to chime in at all i know you were planning to be here just to answer any questions as well but okay um we have some far livestock farmers on the call um, it'd be great to hear some of your experience with meat processing in the state. So um, I only see Henry, but I'm, I'm not familiar with some of the other farmers who might be on the call. So feel free to just unmute yourself and chime in. Well, where you mentioned me, I'll start. Um, my, my big issue that I've run into here uh, for 26 years, I've had my animals processed in Vermont. I mean, in uh, Maine, sorry, uh, at Wyndham. And Wyndham was recently sold uh, to another couple. And they informed me after last year that they would no longer process my animals. Um, now, under USDA, because I have game animals, I can theoretically, under USDA, process them here and sell the meats as cuts because they're not amenable species. However, under the state of New Hampshire, I can't presently do that, which has put me in a real bind because after they informed me that they no longer are gonna do deer, now I can't get processing for over a year and I'm stuck really between a hard, rock and a hard place because I have no way to sell or process my animals. Uh, there are, uh, I could do whole animal sale here. Then I run into the problem with uh, USDA's rules are that if I'm selling a whole animal, it has to first be sold to the customer and the customer actually has to kill it or make arrangements for killing it. And I am not allowed to do that. Under New Hampshire Fish and Game Laws, uh, I am the only one on the farm allowed to kill the deer. My brother who owns deer here cannot kill a deer because his name is not on the permit. Uh, so I'm in a quagmire as to where I'm going to go. Um, I am working trying to get a place to do the slaughter under USDA uh, and then take it to some of the custom or the commercial kitchen type environment to have them cut up for resale and so on trying to work towards that. Um, well, that's sort of, sort of where I am. If anybody has any ideas, I'm a big proponent and have been for 20 years of trying to get a mobile slaughter facility for large animals, not processing, simply slaughter, bring it to a farm or to a central location and do the slaughter under USDA. And I worked on that for 20 years. 
Well, it hasn't happened yet. And Eric's on here. He's the farmer. He'll he can speak up also. Thank you. Thank you, Henry. Does do any of the presenters want to jump on any of the things that Henry mentioned or respond to anything? Hey, this is Tom Henry. Um, I think we, we should probably have a conversation maybe offline to at least go over some of the things. I just want to make sure we're on the right page with, with everything. Uh, you had mentioned a bunch of different things. I, I, some of it pertains to USDA and some of it doesn't, but I want to at least with the USDA stuff, make sure that we are on the right page. So, um, you know, maybe we can touch base next week. I'll make sure you get my contact information uh, and then we can, you know, have a conversation maybe offline sometime next week. Are there any clarifications that you want to make now, Tom? There, there was a lot with it. Um, I just want to make sure, I don't know if I understood with the custom piece with the, I know you talked about non-amenable and amenable. Um, when you talk about the not the amenable stuff um, for custom, I, I, I may have misunderstood. I just want to make sure I get what he said correct, but you can sell live shares of an animal and, and and you can be the agent to those customers and bring it to a custom facility and then distribute the shares of the animals back to your customers i, I just don't know if if i have that right um that was the one of the things i wanted to clarify great thank you so henry we'll get you contact information so that you can connect you're muted. <laughs> this is Eric. Also, be able to hit the space bar and unmute. Make sure, make sure Tom gets mine also. Okay. Can you put yeah. Henry? Can you put yours in the chat? I will. Thank you. Um, and, and I'm on the phone, so I don't I don't see that. So um, if you guys can shoot me an email after, that'd be awesome. We will. Yep. Thank yep. you. Yep. Jennifer, I just had. A couple of comments about what Henry said. This is Eric. Um, the, the problem seems to be right now in New Hampshire, more of a labor issue than anything else. Um, and as Elena said earlier, that's, that's a hard thing to schedule only because historically people had animals on pasture and they'd bring them off pasture in the fall and slot of in the fall but now it seems that there's a lot more going on all year long uh, not just with large animal beef, beef animals but pigs uh, also and so it seems to be spread out a lot more as to what the demand is for facilities for processing and uh, the issue though right now is getting labor skilled labor that knows how to break down an animal particularly, not so much just cutting up primal cuts. Um, there are a lot of people that do that, obviously in the big stores, Market Basket, Hannaford, Shaw's, all of those. That's a little bit different because the training is much simpler, but to train somebody to break down a carcass is a long-term process. And, and most people will tell you that it takes three to six months to train somebody to let them be on their own to break down a carcass unless they've got some experience. Um, just to give you a little bit of background here, in the last three or four months, some of you may be aware that Wisconsin Farmers Union has been doing a series of, of webinars on just the same topic as have some other states. And it's not just a New Hampshire problem, I will tell you right now, it is countrywide. And uh, Wisconsin, for instance, has 200 federally inspected FSIS inspected plants, 200 state inspected plants, and about 50 custom operators. And they're in the same boat. They're already out two years for the scheduling and they can't get the help. And so uh, Henry and I and, and Rob have talked in the past with Farm Bureau about um, looking into developing some sort of a, a training program locally uh, and at one point earlier on in the winter, we were going to look at the possibility of, of uh, tapping into some 
rural development money, but the window for doing that was very short and we didn't really have time to put anything together. However, with the newest um, bill that, that Rob has been talking about, although the rules aren't completely out yet, I don't think, and Rob could correct me, but there is possibly some money for some training. The issue is you need three things. You need A, people who want to get the training, and B, and that's the biggest problem right now is finding people that want to do the work because you're working in a cold environment. It's a lot of heavy work and a lot of people just don't want to do that. They don't want to work that hard. The second thing is finding a facility to do the training. And uh, we have talked a little bit about uh, what the possibilities are for that. In order to set up a new facility, it's extremely expensive. And as you may know, UNH um, got rid of their facility uh, probably about 15 years ago or more now, where they had the meats program there, the meats lab in the Thompson School. That has now gone away, and that facility is no longer available because they're using it for other purposes. It's part of the, the uh, vet tech program, and it's partly the brewery program they have over there. So where do you find a facility? Well, there is a facility that may be available and we're still negotiating uh, about possibly using that. And the third thing is finding somebody who is capable and willing to do the training itself. There are some other states that have training programs. Uh, New York has some training programs. Wisconsin just started two training programs in the last six months, eight months, uh, University of Wisconsin and Madison and Madison Technical College both have two year training certification programs, uh, but uh, not a lot of people. So that's kind of where we're at as far as how do we look at the labor situation and the facility situation is something that is going to have to be uh, really a scheduling problem or a scheduling change maybe needs to be made to even out the demand uh, on a yearly basis for those facilities. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. I'm looking over here in the chat and Judy had a question about um, asking Rob, did you say that there was money at the federal level to build a facility? They bought land, um, beginning a farm and thinking seriously of building a USDA certified kitchen, slaughterhouse, et cetera. So Rob, I don't know if you if you mentioned that there was federal money available. The the monies that are available and in, in the uh, as a result of the the uh, pandemic assistance is for existing facilities. Okay. Right now. Thank you. Um, and then Kathy. I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about your situation. Um, she says here she's got a slaughter date for pigs in November, but the pigs won't arrive until May. Kathy, are you still on the call? Okay, she may have, may have jumped off. Um, but just reiterating that issue that the timing scheduling with slaughtering is challenging. Um, there was a question about USDA. I'll, I'll jump in. This is Mark. I'm with yeah. Archway Farm in Keene. I mean, for a little bit of a different experience, you know, we we ship hogs year round. And I mean, it's been a little tighter with COVID, um, but I haven't had any scheduling issues. And I think it gets to Elena's point that it's really a seasonality issue. And there's so much demand from small producers in the fall that you're going to have a hard time convincing USDA facilities to expand to meet that demand without some assurance that there's going to be a year round, you know, supply of animals. Um, so I think, you know, it's not necessarily the lack of facilities, it's the, the seasonality that's really difficult for slaughterhouses to manage. Just to piggyback on what you said, Mark, it is interesting because I've, I've been doing some um, interview research with beef producers in Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont. And, um, 
the larger the producer, the less issue they've been having with scheduling because they're able to provide a consistent supply and processors like that reliability. Now, it's not that processors don't want to take on um, the smaller folks or folks that don't have that consistent supply. It's just that they can't, they book all of their dates for the folks that can give them that consistent supply. So, you know, it's an interest, it is an interesting thing because it's like, well, how do we help our small producers? Because that is the majority of us in, in the Northeast. And, um, you know, obviously I don't have a good answer for that, but it's like how, yeah, I, I don't know if folks have thoughts, but, you know, is it a collaboration thing? Can, can we do more collaboration to help improve and de like break down the seasonality a bit? Um, but yeah, you, you brought up an interesting point, Mark. You have to think of it from the processor standpoint where there's so much capital invested in the infrastructure and the facilities and training the labor that they can't afford to just use it for three or six months out of the year. You know, I think as, as someone said, these, you know, the farmers maybe do it for a lifestyle reason, but the slaughterhouse people need to get a return on their money. Um, so it's just a simple. Yeah. Oh, your, your sound is cutting in and out, Mark. I'm, I'm good. I'll stop there. <laughs> Thank you. I just want to make sure that we capture some of the comments here uh, in the chat. So there was a comment about Meatworks. Not sure if anyone from Meatworks is on the call, but um, their brand new facility in Westport, Mass. has been a year, uh, years in the making, and they've experienced lots of challenges pre, during, and post the pandemic. So um, they should be involved in the discussion. Is anyone from Meatworks on the call today? Okay. Well, well, we'll try to connect with them post this cafe. Thanks for that. Um, let's see. So if is there a USDA facility that farmers could rent and do the work themselves? It would be similar to their own kitchen. Maybe people who want to buy a cow could even come in and cut their own cuts. So folks who know the regulations and rules around that. I, hey, this is uh, Tom again. Go ahead. I was just—I don't think that's practical to, especially on the slaughter side, have a facility that's rented out. I mean, if you're talking on the uh, just on the cutting side, I think there are facilities that that do that. There's one in Vermont, um, but the slaughter is just too complicated. You need to have the inspector there, um, so to have something that's able to be rented out just doesn't seem practical to me. Thanks, Mark. Tom? Yeah, Mark actually covered that. Yeah, the slaughter side, that would be near impossible to do. Um, it, it just simply wouldn't happen. On the processing end, it's a little different. And we do have a couple. There's Commonwealth Kitchen down in Dorchester, Mass. And there's um, Mad River Food Hub in Vermont that does something like that. They're, they're sort of a commissary style kitchen and you can rent space and go ahead and process products. Um, I don't know if they would allow, you know, you to bring a side of beef in and, and cut it up and do that sort of thing, but it, it might be worthwhile touching base with either one of those firms and asking them if you could do that, you know, and they charge you, you know, anywhere from two to $400 an hour to lease their kitchen space to you to process products. Great. Thank you. Um, Anton has a comment or question here about have there been initiatives to have processing cooperative models in which producers and perhaps consumers invest jointly in building processing facilities, developing training programs, and developing year-round coordinated animal supply program to ensure that there is a year-round consistent supply. Any thoughts about that? I, yeah, I mean, I, and that's kind of the conversation that we've had you know, for the past 30 minutes or so. Yeah, I, I think that needs to be done. I just don't know, um, you know, certainly from the government end, we don't have the wherewithal to, you know, kind of bring that together. That's more, you know, academic or, or um, you know, at least the farmers themselves, if, if they were to jump in and do that, yeah, that certainly isn't a role for government, um, at least not the federal government anyway. But yeah, I think that'd be a, a fantastic idea and it would, as, as Mark spoke about, kind of help that seasonality um, aspect of it where you can kind of generate animals throughout the year 
and maybe help out even the federal establishments during those winter months when they're a little slow, help them stay afloat, help them not lay off people. And then when it comes to busy time, you know, the animal stream tends to even out then where you don't see that glut in September, October, November. So it, it would be helpful if, if that would come to be. Okay, something to think about moving forward. Um, another question, does the labor issue extend to large companies, for example, Tyson processing facilities? If not, are there opportunities there? Uh, yeah, their labor is probably even more uh, more of an issue than it is in the small processors. The small processor at least can have a relationship with their employees. You know, for the most part, um, you know, they end up almost being like family in, in some of these spots. You know, you talk like LeMay's and Gosstown, they've had employees there for years and years. Yeah, and there's going to be certain ones that come and go, and, and they do have labor shortages, but the Tysons of the world, their turnover is, is off the charts. Um, they suffer the same issues that ev everyone else has. Elena, did you want to add to that? Yeah, I'm, a, I'm more out of touch with those larger processing facilities like Tyson, but it sounds like Tom covered it. I would suspect similar issues across the board. Yeah. Well, and there simply aren't any large processing facilities in New England. Right. I mean, the closest one is in Pennsylvania, and some people ship cows down there. Um, but with the exception of that, there's not many that are reachable from here. Right. Um, question here about recent immigrants and um, recent immigrants who have farm backgrounds. Does anyone consider tapping those abilities? Anyone have experience there? I don't have experience, but I think it's a good idea to talk for years about the fact that Americans don't want to do the job, don't have the training, and didn't grow up on farms. And most of your immigrants that are coming into the country come from rural farm type of environment and are used to dealing with that. And I'm not sure whether Rick is that LeMay's has tried to tap into that or any of the other slaughterhouses, but uh, that would go back again to though doing a training, having some kind of training class or something, school that they could go into. On the training though, I do want to uh, throw out COBA skill is within the next month or so having a meat training program out at COBA skill too in New York. Hi, Jennifer. Um, this is Andrea. I, I, before that comment on the refugee labor, I had posted a comment that this is exactly what um, we're trying to do here in New Hampshire um, at Two Mountain Farm. My husband is an Af East African immigrant who also works um, with the refugee farmer training program in, in Manchester and Concord. Um, and there is a huge demand for meat goats. Um, and we recently purchased a farm that has the pasture, it has the barn, we got a grant for fencing. Um, the refugees came up and helped us put up the fencing. They want us to start raising goats right away, but, but because of this bottleneck with the processing facility, certainly something that has kind of stymied our, our entry into this kind of agriculture. And so we've been throwing around ideas, in fact, with some of my colleagues on the call today who are doing similar work in Maine. I know Amy Carrington is on the call um, to start thinking about on-farm processing and some of this producer cooperative models where, yes, these refugees have a demand for me and they have the skill set. They know how to slaughter goats. They do it. They've done it in their own country. They can do it halal. Um, so trying to just put the pieces together on how to go about um, putting together such a big project like this and certainly something that is of interest in this community. Thank you, Andrea. Appreciate that. Um, any other questions or any other um, livestock farmers who want to share their story or experience?
I might jump in just while folks are thinking just to um, maybe continue the conversation about Andrea because I think that sort of joins together some of these different threads about cooperative processing and wondering those of you who have more experience in regulations, what are some of the, the barriers or some of the challenges to doing this cooperative model um, and this kind of on farm site processing, those of you on the call or if you know of other models, folks doing that. I, I'm not a regulator, obviously, but I, I will say I, I know one of the challenges, I, we had a speaker from Yukon Extension and he's done a lot with cooperative marketing in the livestock world. And um, he said one of the challenges, and I'm sure there are many others, um, is just getting that like uniform product because where everybody's production systems vary in their style and their, you know, what they have as a quality product. Um, there's a lot of variability between breeds and how you're feeding them and, and all that kind of stuff. So getting uniformity in a cooperative model, I think, is what I think and have heard as a challenge. And you know, there are some things that, you know, tools out there that can come into play, like ultrasounding, you know, meat and, you know, determining marbling and if it's and that kind of stuff. And again, this is um, something I'm really interested in, but just, you know, we don't have necessarily the resources to, I'm sure somebody does in the area, but I would love to like learn more about this stuff. And I'm sure other folks would too. Um, it's just a matter of tap tapping into who's done it and where, where those people are. Jennifer, could I comment on that just a little bit? Uh, Elaine is kind of talking about something different as far as cooperatives. It's more of a marketing part of it than it is the processing part of it. And there are some places that do that now. Um, historically, uh, the, no, the, the New England lamb, um, project back probably 40 years ago now, um, they, they found that they couldn't supply enough animals to, to supply the Boston market for a year. Uh, so that was a marketing issue more than anything else. But there is, uh, for instance, I just had a conversation with somebody from, I think, Family Farms, uh, which is a website that sells from a whole bunch of different farms. So the product is not necessarily, the, the conformity of the product, product is not necessarily something that plays into it. Our big problem here is not so much the marketing, I don't think as it is the, the processing. The problem with cooperatively doing something like that is again, A, you gotta have a facility. Uh, B, it's a great idea, but in order for great ideas to work, somebody's gotta actually do the work. So who does that? Do you, do you pay somebody to do that? Is somebody gonna do it on a volunteer basis? Uh, and what's that facility gonna look like for most of the year? And in order to pay for it, you gotta, you gotta run it full time. And can you do that? The third part of it is the whole business plan part of it. Um, you know, is everybody gonna kick in money to do it? Are you gonna rent it? And the insurance part of it is gonna be huge because everybody's going to be wielding knives. And uh, there are a lot of issues here that, that you need to think about really hard before you get, oh yeah, that's a great idea. Um, so I just wanted to throw that out that there's two different things we're talking about here. One is processing and the other is the marketing part of it as far as cooperatives grow. And I don't think anybody's got a problem with having a market right now that may change, it may stay the same. We don't know what's gonna happen after this COVID thing opens up. Right now, we're just, everybody's just slammed with people wanting local meats, which is great. Will it continue? I don't know. Thanks, Eric. Eric, if I, if I can jump on for one second. So th there are examples of, you know, really good examples of successful processing cooperative models in the West and, and in other parts of the country. So. I don't think that it is a unique idea. I don't think that it is a, an idea that has been tried and just 
failed over and over again. It, it, it has been successful. Um, and, you know, there are numerous nonprofit organizations that exist to connect farmers to consumers and to help out producers. I'm just, I'm thinking Seacoast Eat Local is just an example of, of one of those. And um, I, I can see that those organizations can be the, the driver that connect that those communities of, of producers to, to pitch in. I mean, yes, it, it will require an investment, um, but it's like buying shares in an IPO um, and, and then you, you get the, the return on that investment. Um, but I agree with you that the, a business plan is absolutely necessary, especially if, if loans are involved um, to, to get the facility up and running. Um, and that, that requires expertise um, and that does require an initial investment. Um, but there are successful models that exist out there. Great, thanks Anton. And someone, um, let's see, Eric DeLuca put in the chat uh, an example in Vermont uh, for a new Americans model. Um, it's been a recipient of state funds and other institutional support, for example, from Vermont Land Trust. So the link is there in the chat, you can check that out. Jim, did you wanna jump in? Yeah, I just had, um, I had a quick question. Can everyone hear me? Yep, so, so I'm on my phone, so I can't, can't see much, but, um, so I'm a farmer and I think the, the seasonality of New England uh, farming, you know, is a real issue. And that's kind of the, the root cause of, you know, not being able to have a consistent beef production or poultry production. Um, I think pig is some, pigs are somewhat unique in that you can kind of utilize a year round production and still reap the benefits of pasture and have a relatively simple facility. But, you know, there's a reason why uh, you know, there's not a huge amount of, of poultry production being done and that's been happening in the South and same thing with pigs. And there's a reason why there's beef um, being produced other places than New England on the large commercial scale, it's just because the environment and the climate here puts, you know, increases the cost of production and constrains the season that we can produce livestock. So if we, you know, really want to address the processing situation, then we have to be able to allow for that seasonality because we all, you know, know that there must have been farmers who really just stuck it out tooth and nails. Like, no, we can produce broilers here. We can produce pigs year round. We can produce beef, but just slowly but surely, you know, the competition uh, from producers, even just down in Pennsylvania or New York, or even just uh, Western Massachusetts that has a a slightly more favorable environment, you know, it's like you're trying to be the size, but you can't compete. And so there is demand for local products. Um, but, you know, just like, like the boom with farmers markets and CSAs, it's like a direct, uh, you know, contact between the farm and the consumers. And if we can, you know, make that connection easier for meat for smaller producers of being able to produce seasonal meat and get it direct to customers are as direct as possible and removing the barriers that, that um, allows us to do that legally. Um, I'm not saying that there needs to be like no regulation at all, um, but um, you know, if we can make it more flexible to allow for seasonal production, for me as a farmer, that's the only way that we're gonna be able to do this. There's no way that we're gonna start looking at um, housing facilities and you know, trying to get consistent year round production because that scale to make all that work is a lot bigger than we're able to do. And um, no one can guarantee that even if a farmer does that, that it's going to make sense because now you're producing so much that your cost that you're going to be able to get as a farmer is going to have to go down so much so you can keep this product moving when you do take it in. So for me, it's, it seems to make sense about removing barriers to get meat from the farmer to the consumer with as little regulation as necessary. So if that's removing the USDA for in-state sales and having a state program, that's great. If it's allowing sales through custom butchers um, for direct, then that's great. And a lot of farms do do that with half animals and whole animals, but there's only a certain amount of consumers who can take a quarter, half or a whole animal. Um, you know, If we can get cuts to consumers as easy as possible from the farm, then that's where I see the biggest 
um, potential for growing the, the local meat market and at least in um, New Hampshire in our area. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Go ahead, Henry. Yeah, I just a uh, couple of thoughts. Um, one, one of the things that might alleviate some of the fall problem, won't alleviate the summer, is putting in, uh, and on one seminar quite a while ago, there was somebody that talked about a butcher in a box. And basically it's a shipping container that comes in and sets down and it doesn't, so your actual infrastructure, it could run during the fall, real busy time, just do cutting, it doesn't have slaughter. So it goes back kind of to the mobile slaughter, but you set that down, the overhead is a whole lot less because you shut it down during the summertime of the year when there's not a lot going on. In order to labor that, and, and this is something I haven't really looked at or studied, I mean, we have contract laborers that come in from everything from healthcare to everything else you can think of. So what it would be the chances that you could get some traveling contract labor to come in and work in that facility for the fall, doing the cutting, and then that would alleviate. Now how USDA would look at that and whether they would put an inspector in just for the fall, I'll leave that up to Tom, but that's <laughs> the thoughts. Yeah, this Tom, that is doable. That does happen in other parts of the country. I mean, it's certainly not ideal, you know, obviously, obviously from, from our point of view, but it is doable and it does happen. Great. All right, we've got another uh, comment in here about poultry processing from Steve and Don Ford. <clears throat> Um, they are poultry producer and process on the farm. What is the possibility of relaxing the commerce inspection rules to allow for wider sales channels rather than trying to get more meat processors to go into business? Um, and then follow up with, we take advantage of the restaurant certification training, but what about allowing in-state sales through food hubs or local markets? Oh, you're muted, Ryan. Did you wanna? <laughs> Sorry, I was kind of talking to myself. <laughs> oh. <laughs> That's okay. Did you do you have a response to that question? Um, my initial response is, is that um, the there's the exemption for the poultry to be sold to restaurants to be uninspected, but in order to sell it to further uh, to local markets or food hubs, it would have to be USDA inspected. So that's the problem with that. Just to add on that, what's interesting about that class, because um, we, we do teach that class, is that I'm finding more and more people that attend. Um, they're not necessarily interested in selling to restaurants, or very few of them end up selling to restaurants. It's more to learn how to safely process their own poultry or rabbits and sell through the exemptions. Um, but it does seem like, you know, that law was created in, or I think 2014, before I was an extension, but it, it went through and was passed based on demand and push. And, um, you know, somebody felt like it was a good way to expand opportunities for producers. So, you know, something like that, I mean, if the law is already in place for it, could it be expanded to more than just restaurants? I don't know, but. Um, something to think about. Steve, did you want to jump in? I did. So, uh, hi. Um, so, uh, at, to Roy Ann's point, I mean, we, we take the certification training and we're, we're well aware that you know, we sell at farmers markets as well, but, and, and on farm, but trying to figure out how we could actually expand the markets beyond just, and kind of as uh, Elena was saying, beyond just restaurants. That's really the, you know, the the need I think for a lot of farm, you know, at least for us and potentially I, I think several other farms that we know, um, you know, and, and with the loss of uh, Granite State poultry, um, I, I see this problem only getting a lot worse uh, because we know a lot of folks that use them for their 
processing as opposed to you know doing it themselves or on farm. So I, I think poultry is going to be a problem in New Hampshire if you know we don't figure something out quick. Thank you, Steve. Sure. Thank you. Question, Je Jennifer. Mm -hmm. uh, for Steve, could you give us a little background, or do you know the background about why they are no longer processing poultry? Uh, the only thing I know, Eric, is that um, right after the beginning of the year, we we basically got a Facebook post from them that said that they have decided to close the business. Um, they weren't selling the equipment. It was already, quote, gone. <laughs> uh, I'm paraphrasing a little bit because I don't remember the exact quote, but uh, and they they basically asked, don't don't contact the people at the farm there where where the facility was located because uh, you know they're not going to be able to help anybody. So so beyond that, I really don't know. I don't know whether they they were also running into. It's possible they were running into labor issues or they just got tired of it i really don't know but i mean i will so one thing i will say is that was a they were one of the few places that we could bring our turkeys uh and you know processing so because we do it on farm we don't have our own barn or facility to do it we're outside <laughs> and uh doing turkeys in november is is we were lucky this past year but it's pretty cold Thank you. We have a few minutes left here, but I see another comment in the chat. Susan, did you want to speak to the blockchain technology? Susan. Well, uh, so a lot of the a lot of the problems, you know, are geared towards the safe food safety, the safety of food, and and the inspection processes um, are attesting to that. And we're just seeing so many. Um, improvements in technology, blockchain technology and others that go direct to food food safety. You know, there are indicators on the market that can be affixed easily to food that, that can trace it, that can immediately tell whether it's safe to consume or not. And, you know, particularly when you're talking about, you know, on-farm process, Processing or small processors getting their product into other um, other opportunities like re retail. Um, the whole point of inspection is that it's that it's safe for the consumer to eat. So if we can advocate for that, and we may need to use some of our really big ag processors and producers to be allies here, but if we can advocate for those technological advances to be recognized and modernize our food inspection and safety rules, that would go a long ways towards helping our smaller producers. Thanks, Susan. Does anyone want to respond to that? Uh, I'd I respond to that. Uh, just, and, and I, ha I hesitate to bring this up only because it's a whole different ball of wax, but um, I'm not sure that all of this regulation has to do with as much about food safety as it does about uh, commerce because, and I don't know how many people are aware or if anybody wants to respond, Colleen or, or Roy Ann or, or Tom, um, I can't sell a product that isn't USDA inspected to a consumer, but I can go out and I can get a roadkill deer, cut it up and give it to a soup kitchen or, or food pantry, and it's no longer a food safety issue. Well, why is that? Anybody want to respond to that? <laughs> hey, uh, this is this is Tom, and I can speak to, to federal law. I mean, at the meat itself federally is regulated by the federal meat inspection act and you know the law is well over 100 years old at this point and it's, it's like I said there are some certainly some limitations to it um and I, I don't see congress making changes anytime soon so uh, for me I'm, I'm enforcing the current federal regulations and law and certainly you can change regulations 
relatively easy. It, it, nothing ever e it, is easy, but certainly um, easier than changing the law itself. And, and as far as you know, roadkill and things like that, that's, that's not our purview. Um, I can only speak to the amenable species, cattle, you know, uh, pigs, goats, and, and sheep. Thanks, Tom. Well, all super interesting and really important questions and comments. It's been a really good conversation. Um, so I just want to point out that Elena said, um, you know, a lot of people don't even think of meat processing as a potential career path. And that's, that's probably true, you know, so how can we work around that as well? Um, so we will, Aaron's been taking really copious notes. Colleen's going to pull things together with the recording and get that back out to you all. Um, and we'll think about next steps in terms of, you know, if there's anything that we could potentially move forward on, whether it's around cooperative meat processing, grant writing, or something like that. So stay tuned and thank you so much for participating, everybody. Thank you.